All right. Well, let's get started here. Um, hi, I'm Sean Brown. I am the CEO of YCharts. Uh, I am super excited to be joined today by Kevin O'Leary, uh, otherwise known as, with the AKA Mr. Wonderful. Many of you know him from Shark Tank and Connor O'Brien. And Connor, I'm not sure, do you have a, an alias or do you just go by the alias Connor O'Brien? I just go by Connor O'Brien. All right. Not, so cool. not on Shark Tank. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are, we are thrilled to have, um, and Kevin's uh, uh, popping on in just a minute. Um, just for the record, I wanna tell you guys that this is a milestone day uh, for me in my career. Um, this is the first time that my mom, who I affectionately call the Nance, my mom has joined one of my webinars. And I'd like to think it's because uh, of the good looks of Connor and myself, but uh, I actually think it, it, it has a little bit more to do with uh, the fact that Kevin's gonna be joining us. Um, Connor, a quick hello to you. For those that haven't heard, I've basically been working with Kevin for well over 10 years. And, uh, you know, we developed OSHAs, we developed this set of indexes. And I think people find them pretty interesting to hear. As those have seen the outline, we know we're going to talk about macro outlook uh, first. And then after our views on the macro outlook, we'll get Kevin to talk about uh, his suggestions on how to win high net worth clients. Of course, there's mostly advisors on this call. Uh, third thing, we'll be talking about Kevin's approach to investing, his family wealth, et cetera. And, um, and then we'll have some time for q and I think we have to, or at least Kevin has to wrap up by 2.45 Eastern uh, to get on to what he's at Harvard to do today. Kevin, how are you today? Very good. Thank you. I'm teaching a class here at Harvard in about 45 minutes, so I'm hoping we're going to use our time fruitfully. Yeah, we will. Uh, Kevin, I do have to tell you, though, I, I was just mentioning to Connor that my mom is joining this webinar for the first time in my career. So this is super, super special. Well, I'm sure she's doing mind. that so she can see her son in action. Yes. It just so happens her, her, her favorite uh, investor on Shark Tank is, well, thank is you joining very us. Much. But hey, listen, I want to make sure we do some quick uh, regulatory uh, disclaimers. First of all, this webinar is meant for educational purposes only and is not intended to be used as investment advice. I know neither YCharts or OShares are acting as advising parties regarding client funds. Mm -hmm. um, this webinar will be recorded and will be emailed out to everybody who registers. It's also gonna be available on our YouTube channel, so please make sure to subscribe. Also, for those of you that are customers of YCharts, all charts that we go over in here will be placed as templates in your YCharts account. So. With that said, let's uh, let's get moving through here. Um, thank you, Connor. You introduced what our agenda was. We're going to go over macro outlook um, and a couple other things. But but Kevin, I'd be a, a kind of remiss if I didn't ask you the obvious question. Somebody's going to put in chat, which is, why has the show Shark Tank been so successful? Because it really chronicles the journey of the American dream, and you know, in in our society. Um, entrepreneurship is not really the pursuit of money or greed, it's the pursuit of personal freedom. And that theme resonates with every strata of society. And that, that is what we've learned about Shark Tank. We're just stewards of the, the entrepreneurial's journey and we chronicle it in a very engaging way on television. And it just never ends, it seems. We're shooting season 15 right now. That's amazing. And I'll tell you the impact on my home. I have a couple teenagers and uh, I'm not sure they've hit on their key idea yet. One came up with cardboard tennis shoes. The other uh, has, is doing some customizations. Let's try to proceed here. What, what I'd love to do is uh, we're going to go over a few macroeconomic slides now and just get a few perspectives on things. So maybe I will, uh, I will tee this chart up for you. Um, this is a percent off high chart. For those of you familiar with these charts, uh, it, it shows uh, in relation to the high, where are these lines headed? And you'll see here, there's four different asset classes represented here. There's the commodities, there's the uh, aggregate bond index, there's US equities, and there are non-US equities. So Kevin, Connor, I look at this chart and I say, things aren't looking that good this year. Um, 
Is there any place that's a good place to invest? You know, the, the challenge with um, investing, period, you're going to find that the majority of the returns happen in five or six percent of the days the market is trading. So, you know, you talk about um, trying to figure out, well, I wish I hadn't participated in this market for the 20 percent down the S&P 500. The problem is there are days when the S&P retraces two and a half percent of that. There's been days where it's retraced five percent of that. And as you learn over time, it is impossible to know when that occurs. So unfortunately, the only way to achieve S&P returns over the aggregate, which is, you know, six to eight percent a year, some years much better, is to be invested all the time. But it's what you invest in that matters, because you could lose a lot more than 20 percent in the S&P if you were in highly speculative companies that have a lot of leverage that trade at very high multiples that are not profitable, that don't distribute any profits. Or you could find the good companies inside the S&P and own those and have less volatility. And I found over a long period of time, I, I concern myself with just being invested all the time. I obviously don't like to see downturns, but they're just part of living and investing. But what I own is more important. And I stay invested because I want those days. I want to be in the market those days when it goes up two to 5%. Mm -hmm. So the old adage, invest smartly, and it's the time in the market, not timing the market. It's impossible to time the market. Everybody tries. When I was a young buckaroo, I certainly tried, and I got clocked because the market always wins. You can't yep. time it. It's impossible. Yep. Well, let's move on to interest rates. The Fed's been doing an awful lot. What we can see here is a, a very steep set of increases in the federal funds rate as obviously uh, trying to tamp down inflation. Um, the, the interesting thing here is not only the increase, but it's what's going on with the yield curve and that's flattening and in some cases inverting. Um, what, what's more of an interest or curiosity or concern for you, the steepness in, of the acceleration or the shape of the curves? Neither. The way I look at it is, all I need to know is what is the terminal rate the Fed is going to take us to? My guess is just under 5%. And so we've got another rate hike or two left, but that means we're in the seventh to eighth inning of hikes. The minute the market figures out the Fed has reached its terminal rate, that day you want to be long the market. I don't know when that's going to be, but it's gonna provide some huge amount of return because that's what the, the market's trying to figure out right now is terminal rate of the Fed. Remember that housing is 40% of CPI, that's the measure of inflation, but it's a trailing indicator and housing's already corrected 20%. It's not reflected in the 8% inflation rate right now. Inflation's probably around 6%, but the Fed's not gonna look at that until it actually it's like the pig through the python. It takes time for shelter or housing, which is 40%. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Siegel, the professor, has been screaming this out for weeks now. Um, but you know, trying to change the way the Fed operates, next to impossible. So you have to realize that you in, in the market have to figure out when, when is that terminal rate gonna be hit? And I don't know. But I would also look at history. These are not particularly high interest rates. Mortgage rates of 7 and 8% are not historically high. It's just that for 20 years, we've had historically low interest rates. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the first sector, which is the 11th sector of the S&P, real estate, was the first to take the hit. But I think the economy is in a remarkably strong position because the consumer still has $2 trillion on their balance sheet because we printed $6.7 trillion for free and gave it to them. And that's why we have inflation in the first place. Yeah. Super, super interesting. And um, when we when we now take a look, we took a look at asset classes and, and yield curve uh, GDP. Um, here we have in purple the real GDP for the, you know the value of the goods and services the U.S. produces adjusted for inflation, uh, and then the real GDP. So the purple line is kind of showing us, hey, we're back on track uh, with a growth trajectory, and the orange is saying hey, we just had uh, a quarter of 2.6% increase in GDP. Um, I think my question for you, Connor and, and Kevin is, 
when's the economic slowdown coming that's supposedly the result of the last slide, the changes in interest rates? There's always a lag. And people argue that uh, the Fed was a bit slow. Um, today's news was very good. You see that the inflation rate annualized over the last few months is actually only about 3.6%. Uh, if they keep their progress on, on moving rates up, we probably will see a, a slowdown. And uh, there are a lot of forecasts that it's going to be the first couple of quarters of next year. But this is if they keep their foot on the brake or they keep moving rates up whether it's 50 bips for the next couple of meetings or that type of number. There's forecasts that 5% will be the peak of the Fed funds move. And, um, you know, we saw Meta and other companies cut headcount. It takes time for that to ripple through the economy. So uh, I think it's too early to say we're not going to see a recession. If you look at the inventory levels, they're really high. And companies aren't selling as much as they used to. Go talk to a retailer down the street, whoever your friendly retailer is. They'll probably tell you that the sales aren't quite what they were in, in preceding months. We'll see what the Christmas season brings for sales and so on. Um, maybe we get away with a fairly soft first, second quarter next year as opposed to a serious recession. And, um, and maybe the Fed eases up and markets go back to normal valuation multiples and earnings keep on growing and People who are invested uh, today and stay invested will, will be happy they did so. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. And, you know, if, if we tie together another element of thing, which is employment, um, the chart we have up in front is the orange is the average hourly earnings. How much does the average American make? Uh, it's $32.50 uh, $32. an hour. The unemployment rate, the purple line, is the really interesting one. We have quickly gotten ourselves back to a uh, 70-year low um, uh, employment, unemployment rates, which says America's working. Um, can, you know, I guess either of you, Kevin or Connor, um, what does this slide tell us about the future? What does this slide tell us about uh, you know, can we really be in a recession with such wonderful employment rates in the United States right now? Well, it's very difficult to compare one recession to another because they all have different personalities. The last one that was really dramatic was caused by over leverage in the financial services market. You remember 08, 09. We don't have that situation now. Banks are much healthier. Uh, stress tests were put in place, all that. So this one is caused it's a self-inflicted wound it's it's very hard to print 6.7 trillion dollars it's never been done before pandemic related obviously but it, it's never been experimented before no, no economy has ever printed that percentage of gdp and basically in a matter of it was 26 months just poured it into the economy and so at the same time the pandemic caused some supply chain shocks we're still suffering with those and then you can question the policy on energy because inflation is measured from a pain point from really two perspectives. One is the cost of protein in food. So the price of a turkey for this Thanksgiving is three times what it was 18 months ago. And um, energy, obviously, we've shut down uh, pipelines and all the rest of that. And I'm not trying to be critical of the administration. I'm just saying these are facts. And so printing the money shutting down supply chains, uh, mistakes in energy policy, um, that is why we have inflation. And so the, the trouble is usually in inflationary periods, you have high unemployment rates past 6%. Not this one, um, because that $6 trillion is still sitting in the pockets of consumers and, and they're buying stuff from businesses and that hasn't shown much change yet. So we're not we're in a different kind of situation, which has some narrative, some speculation going on that perhaps we're going to see that soft landing, which we've never seen before, or very rarely have ever seen. Not sure that's true, but um, in the meantime, we're going to have a pretty good holiday season. People have money; they're going to be buying stuff. Um, sales won't be off that much, and the only sector that's really showed the impact of the rate hikes so far has been housing. It's on, it's down about 20%. So 
that's not a shock. Cost of capital is higher. Mortgage rates are significantly higher. They're more than 25% higher. You could have got a mortgage for 4%. Now you're going to pay 7 So, you know, but it, that's what happens. And at the end of the day, um, that's what the Fed wanted. They wanted to cool things down, and they're getting it. Yeah. And, and then we bled a little bit in this slide, and so maybe I'll just uh, just give the voiceover to this. This is the, the Fed funds rate versus inflation. And as you can see, um, for the most part, over the past 60-some years, the funds rate has uh, exceeded the inflation rate. I think we can all see from this slide that um, you know, we're not there yet. And even though the funds rate has gone up quickly, it is nowhere near where it's been in historical times. So, um, you know, to your point about uh, hard or soft landing, TBD, and I do know you, you addressed a point that we, uh, a question we did have in the chat, which was, um, did the Fed act too late um, through this period of artificial low interest rates, Kevin? You know, there's one thing I say about the Fed, it, whoever the Fed chair is, it's the hardest job in the world. Everybody hates you all of the time. Mm-hmm. Either you're not moving sooner or you're moving too much <laughs> or not enough. You can't make anybody happy and they don't try. They just don't care. And I think that's the right way to run that mandate mm-hmm. is to do what you think is right for the economy because that's what you're hired to do give price stability and full employment. That's the mandate of the Fed. They don't try it. They're not involved in politics. Um, And everybody hates the Fed chair. So I, you know, I I admire anybody who takes that position, but he has no, or she has no fans. Yeah. It's, it's much like leading. uh, I led uh, community baseball one time in my town. Um, It's a thankless one. Don't lead community baseball and do not uh, lead the Fed. Um, So, Kevin, my last question for you before we move on to the next section of our agenda is a lot of our listeners are small business owners, RIAs, uh, or other small business owners. And and you obviously, through Shark Tank, have a whole portfolio of small businesses. Given the slides we just went over, what guidance are you giving to those small businesses about what they should be doing heading into 2023? Yeah, we, we actually look at this data across a portfolio of over 50 private companies in all sectors of the economy. We do gym equipment, commercial kitchens, insecticides, um, all kinds of different uh, greeting cards. So we have a pretty good cross section and we see that the data we look at is just two numbers each week. It's revenue and free cash flow. And you can tell everything from a business that's private from revenue and free cash flow. So as I mentioned, we haven't seen the recession yet. Um, Doesn't mean we won't. And the challenge for all small businesses in this quarter, because we have a three day extras of holiday selling, is what to do about inventory. If you've convinced yourself that there's going to be a slowdown with the consumer, you may cut back on inventory and then find yourself with not enough inventory to sell for demand, which is just as bad as having too much inventory. So trying to figure out how much inventory is is the challenge of S&P 500 companies and small business in America, because all day long, the press talks about the recession, but all day long, your consumers are buying stuff from you. So what I tell my CEOs and what we've learned to do over 20 years is just solve for the customer, 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 just take care of them. And then when the recessionary times come, they take care of you because people tend to go back to products and services they're happy with. And if you can keep a happy customer during times of volatility in terms of demand equation, you'll do well. And it's the companies that have figured that out that survive the downturns whenever that comes. Maybe it's next year, maybe it's not, nobody knows. But if you just go customer, 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 that's how you survive. Yeah, that's great advice. And by the way, it's a nice segue for me to thank you and Connor for being customers of YCharts. Um, we don't take any of our customers for granted, so it's awesome to have you guys on our show. Um, so let's talk about, uh, Kevin, your strategies to win high net worth clients, and, and what do you think the right approach? And after we do that, we're going to talk a little bit more about your investment philosophy. So talk us through it. Yeah, and so it, it, at, any, at any one time... Um, in my portfolio, 15% of the companies are in play. In other words, they're being acquired by strategics, hedge funds, private equity firms, 
lately SPACs have been buying a lot of them. And um, 70, just on an anecdotal story, 75% of my returns over the last 15 years have come from companies run by women which is rather interesting, even though they don't know each other or they don't work in the same sectors, they tend to be very, very good uh, in managing and mitigating risk in small and mid-sized companies. So what ends up happening for me is I've known them for sometimes three to seven years. They're very familiar that, you know, I, I also uh, run a trust for my family. So they're always asking me advice on what to do with their exits. And you know, when you, let's say a typical, I had one of these just a couple of weeks ago, $125 million exit, all cash after tax, just under a hundred million. So what does she do with that money? And so I help them deploy it. I don't manage it. I just help them meet managers. And generally, uh, you know, a hundred million is not enough to open a family office. It sounds like a lot of money and it is, but not enough to hire a team of researchers and money managers. And you need a lot more than that. But so what generally happens is that the assets get split up across two different institutional platforms to get some platform diversification. Now, when that occurs, I sit on the presentations from many different broker teams. So if you're walking in with $50 million, you're going to get the attention of most of the high end teams in any firm. And so we do you know, a bake-off. We do a bunch of meetings and we meet different teams on Zoom calls. Um, and so I, I, I'm going to give you some advice about what, and I've seen so many of these presentations go well and many, many go poorly. So number one, it's the slide says it all here. These families don't need to beat the market. They've already beat the market. And I would say this about any single client with more than $5 million, which is a very desirable client. They're not looking to outperform. They're looking to preserve their wealth. So the mantra of the advisor from the minute you pitch during the entire relationship is that of preservation, not performance. They don't need to beat. And I'll give you an example. Um, th the idea that you know, you've worked your 20 years and sold your company and made all that money and then take inordinate market risk is just not in their heads. Usually the entrepreneur, whether it's a man or a woman, in my case, mostly women, are terrible individual investors. Very, very bad. For one metric, they just don't diversify. They don't know how to do that. No one's taught them how to do a diversified portfolio. So they need advisors. All they know is their business and they've done a great job with that. They also do a lot of research online. And I keep telling advisory teams, put up your profile on LinkedIn because these families are going to go search you before they do the call with you. And if you don't even exist on social, you don't exist to them. They, everybody thinks something as nefarious is happening if you don't have a profile on social media. What is it you're trying to hide? So that's really become a big deal these days. And I suggest professional photographs, short three paragraph descriptions of the team and what they do and how they manage money, et cetera. Um, I would also tell advisors listening on this call, no matter how optimistic you are that all that stuff you're emailing to your clients is being read, uh, nobody reads it. So the only thing they look at is on the monthly statement or the PDF they get, maybe they get it online. Um, they look at what they gave you. So let's say they gave you a $5 million mandate and they go to the last page or sometimes it's the front page, they see the account value. Sometimes it's AUM, sometimes it's total value of account, whatever. If it's 5,200,000, they're not gonna call you. They're very happy, but so what? If it's 4,900,000, they go out of their minds. So you're not paid to take risk. You're paid to preserve money. And I'm sure all of them have experienced this, but I'm no different. I don't, I assume, that you're going to make me money. I don't need to make more than the market makes. I just want to preserve my money, but I don't like losing money. So it's a very bad idea to take high risk strategies when you're managing high net worth, really bad idea. Recently, I did a call with a fixed income team. I tell this story all the time, team out of Chicago, 
I use them, two guys, uh, elderly men in their 70s, uh, very strong on uh, corporate paper, triple B and above, really strong. And, you know, those, those rates have gotten interesting of late. The uh, bond market, like everything else, has got clobbered as rates went up. But now the yields are starting to get interesting. You can make 6% on mandates, blended bond funds, triple B. You make more than that in some cases if you're willing to take five to seven year duration. So we were doing a Zoom call with these two with a family. and That family had a 23-year-old son. Maybe he was 27, I can't remember at this point, but 20, you know, in his 20s. And I, I let the two guys do their pitch. And the, as soon as the, the video was over, the Zoom was over, the son called me and said, Kevin, those guys are going to be dead soon. They're old geezers. Why are you giving us dead guys? We don't want dead guys. We want people that are going to be able to manage this wealth as it transfers to me and my sisters. And those, those guys, they'll, they'll be toast. What should have been there, it hit me like a ton of bricks, is a team with a younger member on it somebody that represents the next gen you know part of part of the team and, and every advisor i think has seen this happen if you're if you're managing you know high net worth individuals you better have a continuity story on your team that someone's going to take over from you that, that knows the families and that's what they were looking for so those guys this is the first time they didn't get the mandate to run the triple b book because uh, they were dead guys so you have to be you have to be savvy to how you market the continuity of what you're doing. Um, I've seen leverage used to boost returns. Stupidest idea I've ever seen. Don't use it. It always bites you in the hiney eventually. Really bad. And the other thing of late, which is starting to really matter because of tax code changes, both state, municipal, and federal. When you're dealing with clients who are anticipating wealth transfer or exits, you got to have a tax advisor or at least a relationship with one because tax is the biggest bite on these deals. So I like teams that have uh, insurance planners, uh, tax planners on them uh, that can really be holistic in how they treat high net worth individuals. You, you provide all this kind of service, you'll have very sticky money. And nobody will be saying, oh, gee, you, the S&P beat, uh, you know, beat you by 80 basis points. They don't care. They don't care. They care that you preserve their money. That's the number one message I have to advisors that want to build big AUM. That's awesome, awesome advice. And and let's let's dovetail into though when you've got the money, whether it's a high net worth individual or another individual or family, what are the maybe you guys can walk us through the key things you look for when you're evaluating investment opportunities. Well, you know, I'm going to let Connor talk about this, but I use um, the O-Shares ETFs in, in my trust. There's four of them, and I give you the percentages. My largest holding is 40% in the U.S. large cap, which is basically a subset of the S&P. It's the top quality companies, 100 out of the 500. I really care about, you know, balance sheets and companies, their ability to make money. Their business plans aren't at risk. They have high returns on assets. They generate free cash, they distribute it. That's the kind of thing I wanna own. Um, it's a very systematic way of looking at it. It's a rules-based strategy. Um, it's, it's just a really high quality index and it's 40%. And 20% is held in the same rules-based product in Europe, where there's 50 names that I own there. And an interesting product for mid-cap, OUSM, it basically, looks at the Russell 2000, of which two thirds of the companies are abysmal. They don't make money and they have a terrible return on assets metric. But there are some good companies more in the $5 billion market cap that are growing slightly faster than the S&P and distribute capital. And we own those in, in OUSM. And then I'll let Connor talk about OGIG because that's growth. But this approach of how to manage money is about taking a quality viewpoint for a very long term and preserving because it's a lot less risky in the sense of volatility and that's why i use it got it connor you want to walk us through the the four key levers yeah i will um it's really based on research kevin of course has a uh, risk tolerance like a lot of high net worth people which is reflecting his comments he's already beat the market now he needs his wealth to be protected to grow it but 
with a high degree of protection. So when you, we did research, you can look at the next slide and it'll show one of the results that um, if you actually look at all the large cap companies in the S&P 500 and identify profitability using ROA, identify companies by quartile, the companies in the top two quartiles have far better performance than those that have weak ROA, low ROA. Then if you look at dividends, in the next slide, you see dividend growth and dividend coverage ratios are really good identifiers of companies that perform. A company can grow its dividend. It's likely to be you know, in the upper two quartiles here and generating better performance over a five-year period. Not every day. Investing is a multi-year um, strategic process as opposed to a trade. And if you look at dividend coverage, this is a quality aspect. Companies that can afford the dividend they're paying are the ones that grow well. Final thing here is leverage. And think of where we are now, increasing interest rates. This becomes even more important today than in past years when, when interest rates are so low. In almost every sector, companies with better balance sheets, less leverage, outperform their peers that have more leverage. So those are the cornerstones of the OUSAX index. The same kind of rules and results apply and are used in small and mid cap, so the OUSM index. And for Europe, large cap, it's really the, the 50 uh, selected highest quality large cap stocks in Europe. You end up with a portfolio that looks like this, far more profitability, dividend growth, and so on. Um, Kevin mentioned OGIG, and I want to take a minute on that. One more slide that shows long-term risk return of the OUSAX index. So you can see what you just saw there, but the slides will be available to people later. You basically get what we think are really attractive returns with less risk. Quick comment on OUSAX because of people basically who held the tech stocks in the past several months, I've obviously seen them decline. Uh, if you just skip ahead there, Sean, those two slides, you'll see what's really driving the investment thesis for, OU, for OGIG. It's this worldwide spending on digital transformation. And this is a forecast from Statista, it's basically 56% growth from this year to three years out. This is their forecast of the kind of spending growth you're going to see across all these different companies that are providing services to allow businesses from ours and what we're using today to all the services advisors and retailers and manufacturers are using, essentially digitizing everything they can with their business process. So the spending is going to keep growing. The stocks have become unusually cheap on the price to sales basis relative to where they were even pre-COVID. Interesting time to have a look at them. The next slide just shows you what you get if you apply rules to select stocks within the tech space, but making revenue growth an important characteristic. And that's what you get out of the OGIG index. You get about twice the revenue growth as you'd get in a NASDAQ 100 or a tech sector tracking index. So that's enough of the, um, the summary of these. The slides are available to people. We're happy to give you more information. Send a note to info at oshares.com. We'd be happy to uh, engage with you and provide more info or analysis. Yeah, and for those, for those of you that are YChart subscribers, uh, the ETFs associated with these indexes, OUSA, OUSM, OEUR, and OGIG are all available for evaluation and, and, and your better understanding on the YCharts platform. That's great. So, Sean, thank you very much for, for that. And um, I think we now have a few minutes for some Q&A. Sean, there were some questions popped into the Q&A box. Maybe let you select one or two. And Kevin, maybe we could do like a CNBC style lightning round with quick question, quick answer, cover a handful of them and, and then let, let you get on to what you're uh, in Boston to do after this. Yep. Ready for a quick one, Kevin? Um, sure, what's your good. view on cash today and cash alternatives like insurance strategies for estate planning purposes? Yeah, you know, I, I do use those. Um, you know, the cash has been very difficult of late because you're basically being taxed at 8%, that's inflation. So you, you have to try and find something to mitigate that. Um, the money markets are now yielding about 3.2%. So a lot of it's gone into that. But, you know, alternatives, including insurance, um, are getting more attractive because as, as, as people age, they want less volatility. And so, um, the, the real bogey, though, is is using cash to somehow to find out a way to distribute six percent. So there's always people, because that's the bogey of most trusts and pension plans and 
uh, sovereign wealth plans. They're, they're looking for a 6% distribution, particularly if they're supporting social missions or whatever else. Okay. And the temptation is to use leverage because you can make 4% you know, on, on very conservative paper and on, on, on risk-free paper in the case of a treasury. But if you lever it up um, to get to that six, that's where you run into trouble. So I'm always cautious when people tell me oh, I'm using cash to generate 6%. I smell leverage a mile away and I avoid that with the plague. Hey, another great question is, why is gold performing so poorly in these high inflation times? Yeah, that's true. I'm, I, I, I maintain gold bullion at 5% weighting in all of our portfolios. Um, and the best answer to that, having been using gold for 30 years in my portfolios, gold underperforms until it doesn't. And then you just don't know when that is. Go look at a gold chart sometime and watch how incredible it is. It can sit docile for a decade and then all of a sudden be the major reason your portfolio is performing in a very short period of time. It's just one of those asset classes that, um, and, and many people have tried to own miners instead, but the challenge with owning a miner is that you're buying it to get access to the commodity, which is gold bullion. When you buy the miner, you're putting idiot management between you and the price of the bullion. And so you have to try and find management teams that control costs pretty well all miners can't. I just don't buy miners anymore because they're just really bad at managing businesses. And I don't want to be you know, negative to any one sector, but if you're going to own gold, own gold. For a while, people used to say, oh, well, people are buying Bitcoin instead of gold. Well, lately, that hasn't been a great strategy, obviously. <laughs> Especially the last 24 hours. Yeah. Sean, there's a question I see here I, I think Kevin would like to answer. It's really about dividends, and I'll add a comparison to it. It's this question about, uh, is it risky to use dividends to fund a lifestyle? Uh, would fixed income be better? No, I think a blend of both. I used to be 50-50 fixed income and dividend paying stocks. I'm now 70% dividend paying stocks and 30% fixed income. It's not enough yield yet to switch to a 50-50 yet. Um, bonds, are, bonds did just as poorly as stocks this year because as rates moved up against them, they really declined in mark-to-market price. So you, you, you can't protect, you can't make the assumption I'm gonna buy bonds and protect myself. That's not true, it doesn't happen. You have to wait till they mature to get your principal back and that's only if they're risk-free, treasuries. You always have equity risk in corporate paper. Something happens to the company. So I, I'd argue that, you know, buying quality dividend paying stocks for the long term, even if you're managing a portfolio in your 60s and 70s and 80s is still better than owning bonds. Because as many, many good companies increase dividends over time, there's lots of examples of that. And you're the beneficiary of that. And you can use the distribution to fund your lifestyle. Two other comments to add. The correlation between bonds and stocks used to be negative. It's turned positive. That's why they all went down at the same time. And the other thing is the yield levels on equities uh, not only are in, you know 2% plus is on, on markets, they have a history of growing at about 10% a year. So as you know, with bonds, yields stay fixed for the life of the bond uh, if there's no default. So with equities, you can get dividend income and income growth. And Kevin, I, you, I, Kevin, I know you need to go. So I wanted to ask you one last question. It's about Shark Tank, which is what's the one deal you passed on that you wish you hadn't? Ring, the, the company that was, Jamie, the name of the entrepreneur who invented Ring, that doorbell camera, mm -hmm. uh, came on looking for 600,000. I offered it to him in debt and I would take equity as a kicker or a teaser. He didn't do the deal, but it was sold to Amazon three years later for 1.2 billion. I would have made $200 million on that deal. I didn't, um, but I've made plenty of good winners and had a bunch of losers too. You can't cry over spilt milk. There's always the next deal coming through. But Jamie and I are good friends now. We meet every year in Nantucket on July 5th and uh, talk about the old days. <laughs> and I watch his private jet fly in, you know. <laughs> well, listen, you two, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being customers of Y Charts. I do want to remind those listening that this will be recorded, emailed to you, and available on our YouTube channel. Also, all of the charts you saw are available with as templates within the Y Charts application. Kevin and Connor, thank you guys so much. Okay, ciao. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you.